Before I begin this morning's sermon, I'd like to just say thank you to those who made today's service possible and say how pleased we are to be with you today. Sixty years ago, I had a bonanza of Christmas gifts from my family, which reinforced my passion for learning about the Civil War. I was 10 years old that year. Under the tree were two books about the war, including one called Two Flags Flying. I also received lots of toy soldiers and play sets and a replica of a cannon that shot little plastic cannonballs, Remco's Johnny Reb, which had a holder in the carriage for the Confederate flag, symbol of history and tradition to some, and of the legacy of slavery and white supremacy to others. Two flags flying represents that dual understanding. It sounds like two legitimately elected governments with symbols waving in the breeze. We all learned that the Civil War was something that school children should realize was not anything about rebels who were traitors, who were trying to destroy our country. Oh, not that. Then there was Robert E. Lee, who was often remembered as a noble hero who only took command of the South because of his loyalty to Virginia. But it turns out that was hogwash too. He was a racist slaveholder. Why wouldn't we tear down the statues of this icon of the Confederacy? Why should America celebrate the legacy of racism and slavery? We also learned slavery was not profitable and that it would have died out in the natural course of history. But in fact, it was highly profitable. All of these were the myths that fed my understanding of Civil War history. Well, today I have a new fascination with the past, which stems from reconsiderations of our history as a country and as a religious movement. We often invoke George Santayana. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The problem is we often remember different pasts, truths that are not truthful or only partially so. And finally, so many historical stories that have been lost to us. Often there are kernels of truth in myths, but the truth is more complex. We want to take credit for the courageous few among us in order to absolve us from the uncomfortable reckoning with our past and our present. These myths protect our sense of innocence and goodness, but at what cost? Our failure to confront uncomfortable truths keeps us from living up to the promise of our faith because we are afraid to question the fruits of our privilege. That has been true for my understanding and study of Unitarian Universalist history. We have often promulgated myths that religious liberals were mostly supporters of the American Re Revolution, were ardent abolitionists, reformers and progressives always. But the truth is that many of our ancestors were members of the economic elite who did not favor disruptions of the fabric of society, but wanted to maintain the status quo. During the antebellum period, many Unitarians were the ship owners and mill company executives who profited from slavery. It was once said that the bell of the Waltham Church was stuffed with so much southern cotton it could not ring out for freedom. But we should not neglect the past. 
nor let the stories of injustice immobilize us, but instead should learn and teach the truth and ultimately take responsibility for living up to the vision of justice embodied in our history. One of the unsung heroes of Unitarian Universalist history is Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who was minister here in Newburyport in the 1840s. His name is emblazoned on the wall right over there. I say unsung because most people are not aware of his many contributions to our history. Perhaps you are, but for those who are not, after he left Newburyport, he was one of the Secret Six, a group of clergy and lay people who helped raise funds for John Brown's plans for a slave rebellion. He was the commander of the first regiment of freed slaves during the Civil War. He was a profound essayist and had many literary interests. He began a correspondence with an unknown poet in Amherst, Massachusetts, by the name of Emily Dickinson, and the rest is history. It becomes children's books. He gave us one of the first religious writings to acknowledge the equal inspiration in all the world's religions, called the Sympathy of Religions. I lectured on him recently in a piece on affirming the human body and its physical nature in response to the highly intellectual Unitarian faith, saying that sometimes we're all in our heads. He has been called the grandfather of the muscular Christianity movement, which had a positive side of bodily development and a negative side of warlike colonialism. It was February 1847 when Higginson first preached here in Newburyport fresh out of Divinity School. He liked Newburyport, finding in 1847 that it was not, he said, the decayed place it was 10 years before that. The factories had made it large and bustling. After another visit in August, he felt Newburyport would allow him a free pulpit because he did not spare the slave power in his sermon. Yet this town was a pro-slavery place. Only a decade before, a meeting of the Essex County Anti-Slavery Society had been attacked by a mob. The congregation here knew about his radicalism as they heard it in his candidating sermons. But badly wanting a minister, they called him anyway. His radicalism complicated his ministry even though, by all accounts, he was a good pastor. His politics included pro-labor and temperance lectures in town. He was not silent on the present-day evils of the social system. Well, Higginson, as most of you probably know, in the due course, resigned from the congregation, and we would typically blame his demise on radical politics. But as usual in these cases, it is a matter of style and approach that can prove so disastrous. He condemned the people again and again for celebrating temporal goods as the end of all blessings. He refused to modulate his tone or try to come to some common understanding. He was certain that he could change them Thus, he did not understand their history or lives, nor they his. We might want to make him our hero today without understanding the complete context of conflict over social action, capitalism, and privilege. Two years ago, this coming May, George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. In the wake of that tragedy, Andrea and I attended a local rally in Rockland, Maine. Crucial parts of the rally included nine minutes of silence 
in commemoration of the nine minutes he suffered with the police officer's knee on his neck. The silence was soon followed by a meditation in which we were called upon to repeat his name. Say his name, George Floyd. Saying the name means so much because for centuries we have neglected to say the names and tell the stories of those who have suffered oppression and injustice. We have been silent. Churches tend to be silent on stories of ministers being dismissed from the pulpit. The parts of our history we are uncomfortable with, we try not to talk about. I have noticed this when Universalists embraced spiritualism and Unitarians affirmed eugenics. Talking to the dead and believing that some races are better than others is embarrassing to us today, and so we are silent. But it's important for us to remember why we adopted these stances initially. And so we try to remember not to make us feel bad, but to realize that we are like all humans for those who grieve, for ones who have died, and long for those relationships to continue. And second, that we all feel dismay over the suffering of some people and want no one to endure so much hardship. Mistakes have been made over attempts to alleviate pain. And so we must reveal the complete truth about a neglected, uncovered past. Unitarian Universalism does not have an idyllic past. We were not all abolitionists. We were often rich and privileged and made money from slavery. Even our heroes like Higginson were often difficult human beings who would not listen to their people. We live in a time when it is good to re-examine our history, a time when it is good to look into our own hearts. What heroes have been erased? What stories have we neglected to tell? Hidden history asks us to raise marginalized voices and let them be heard. When I wrote a history of the Watertown Church, I did not even know that an African-American barber named Charles Lennox, who worked on Main Street, was a member of the famous 54th Massachusetts Regiment in the Civil War. As a child, he had sat in the gallery of the first parish of Watertown, which was the only place reserved for African-Americans. We say the name, Charles Lennox. We have a great history, one that has attracted many persons wanting to embrace a free church for truth. That is what our Transylvanian ancestors taught us. Always be open to new truths. We want to listen to all our history and tell it truthfully and openly. Of Higginson, it was once said, that his whole life was a sermon on freedom. May we use the freedom of our faith to listen for truth, listen for justice, and listen for love. Six years ago, the week after the swearing in of the other guy, as Joe Biden calls his predecessor, my sermon was called The Big Chair, and in it, I relayed the story of my great-grandfather, who, in family lore, represented success, life before the fall from grace into the class of regular people in which I was raised. He was a bank president, the owner of the newspaper, a businessman, the guy for whom the town library and the local swimming pool were named. Levi Greenwood owned a furniture manufacturing company in central Massachusetts, 
where there is literally an enormous wooden chair with his name on it. He was, for a time, the president of the Massachusetts Senate. My grandmother had loved her father deeply. As a child, I remember her telling me that when he died suddenly in 1929, her hair turned white overnight. She was 33. When I was the age she had been when the color drained from her hair, Mark and I had a son and named him Levi Greenwood Harris. I don't think I was in thrall to the power implicit in the man's story, but there was something about the tangibility of it all, the pool, the big chair, my grandmother's devastation. Plus, we liked the name. Then the internet was invented, and Wikipedia. And I learned, as they say, the rest of the story. Adamantly opposed to women's rights, suffragists organized in opposition to Greenwood, and he lost his Senate seat in 1913. Calvin Coolidge became president of the Massachusetts Senate, his stepping stone to the national arena. And Mr. Greenwood disappeared the way failed politicians used to. Often what we're looking for in appeals to the past are origin stories that not only explain who we are and how we got to the places we find ourselves, but a kind of vindication that shows goodness and truth on our side. But life has a way of complicating everything, especially the myths we like to live by. My grandmother, the daughter of this anti-suffragist, was not docile or obedient or conventional in any way. She was a rebel, fiercely independent, and completely out of step with mid-20th century American values. It was very odd to think of her having such a strong relationship with a man who seemed the height of convention. But, of course, a lot of the men who were against women's suffrage did not discount women in the way we might think of it today, with the Harvey Weinstein or Jeff Jeffrey Epstein or Bill Cosby or other man in the big chair stories. Rather, they were afraid that if women were able to vote, prohibition would be ushered in. And in addition to making it harder to get a drink, a big part of the economy would be driven out underground, out of their banks and into the hands of organized crime, which turns out to have been a completely reasonable fear. So all of this is a long way back to the story of Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who, as Mark said, arrived here in 1847, fresh out of seminary. The Mexican-American War was raging. Frederick Douglass had just established his abolitionist newspaper, and Jefferson Davis was newly appointed to Congress. Thoreau had just left Walden Pond to set about writing his book in search of a life beyond possessions and ownership. Here in Newburyport, after decades of decline following the Great Fire and the trade embargoes that had devastated the distilleries earlier in the century, the Ocean Steam Mill was completing its very first year of operation, producing bolts of cotton broadcloth and calico and signaling the transition of the town from a maritime economy to an industrial one, but one that still relied on the slave economy. But the mills were a taste of hope on the horizon for all of the settled wealth in town. The 24-year-old Higginson began with enthusiasm and purpose, immediately reaching out to the mill workers and beginning a school for them Immigrants, women, and children, and almost all freshly arrived from rural areas, either inland or abroad. Iginson started a writer's group for young women, and he helped prepare some of them to teach in the mill workers' school. Pro-labor, pro-suffrage, and pro-temperance, Higginson was, as Mark said, also pro-abolition 
and he insisted on making townspeople conscious of the source of the raw cotton for the mill. He and the congregation soon parted ways, a mismatch between the pastor and the people. But that's really only true if you're talking about the people who were used to having the minister's attention. Higginson actually was phenomenal at outreach and with the teenagers in the congregation. Jane Andrews, whose grandfather had been the minister here and whose name is just two above Higginson's, was 14 years old when Higginson arrived. He invited her to take part in a small writing group at the church, which launched her on a career that had her teaching at Antioch before opening a school for girls on High Street here in town. She was innovative, especially in the teaching of geography, and her fantastically titled Seven Little Sisters Who Live on a Round Ball That Floats in the Air was enormously popular for almost a century. It was translated along with many of her other books into Chinese, Japanese, German, and French, and used by teachers across the globe. I could list other women nurtured by Higginson's small group ministries who long after he was gone were finding their voices and their incomes in teaching and writing. Several of them became quite well known. But my point is not to lionize him or these women, but to suggest that he understood that we all matter, that the life of a congregation is in all the people. By paying attention to everyone, even the historically marginalized, he was not necessarily taking a prophetic stand against mill owners or ship captains or distillers. To view it that way keeps those with wealth and power at the center of the story. Rather, he was doing his job, pastoring without fear or favor, extending his care to all, even those who were systematically excluded from power and unable to vote on his position. I don't think, given the political climate we're living in, that I need to belabor the significance of his understanding that everyone's voice must count, that a true leader represents the voices of everyone, not just those who've amassed fortunes and are afraid of losing them. Recently, I read a book by a physician, Arthur Kleinman, who talked about what it means to care, to offer care. And he described a willingness to stay turned toward one another, even in the midst of pain and confusion. It isn't easy. It requires that we acknowledge tremendous suffering and understand that our capacity to look that reality in the eye is the key to building emotional and moral resonance to actually knowing each other in a way that provides comfort and solace. There's no script for this, no blueprint for success other than a refusal to live on the surface, and perhaps a belief that there are always dimensions to our existence that we cannot fully know, that don't have some simple meaning. Kleinman is a doctor addressing a certain kind of care, but aren't we all in need of a practice that helps us regard one another with compassionate attention, alive to the mysteries within and all around? What is this life like for you? It's a question that creates a whole different story of who we are collectively and individually. What is this life like for you? behind the high hedges that shield you from view, or beyond the exhaustion that keeps you from sharing your burdens? What do you hope will bloom? And where will you find mysteries that keep you alive to the wonder of the world? Towards the end of his life, Higginson donated his books on the history of women to the Boston Public Library a thousand volumes that still form the backbone of their collection on the subject. He wanted a country that ignored rivalries or antagonisms 
and focused on cooperative efforts to improve life for everyone, which required that the legacies and achievements of neglected groups be collected, documented, and transmitted to the next generation. The bigger story, the great American narrative, would always be a more complete history, one that integrated all of us and left no one behind. So may it be.